Hey there, welcome back to the Path to Zion podcast, where we are rediscovering the ancient way. Thank you for tuning in today, whether you are listening to the audio over at pathtozion.com or you are on our YouTube channel watching the video. Uh, we are very thankful for you to take your time, which is very valuable, to uh, listen to anything that we have to say here. Now, we are talking about the gospel, the good news. And what if, what if those of us who have been raised in Christianity have never really known it? What if we've not known it in its fullness? What if we have been, whether deliberately or just in our lazy ignorance, just never really discovered what the full gospel is? And so we're, we're trying to allow the Word of God to tell us, in part, what it is. What is the gospel? What is the good news? Now, we've talked about already that it can be obeyed, it can be disobeyed. Yeshua made it clear that you must believe in the gospel. Um, we talked about how, I believe, an example that we've been trying to set up in part two, we were trying to establish the point that we have got to acknowledge that when we encounter Yeshua for how, how he is, who he is, what he is, was, and what he came to fulfill and accomplish, we have got to willingly acknowledge that we have not known him. We have not known him as he is. And I think the Bible, when we study the life of Messiah and all the things that happened when he was interacting with other human beings, how people were constantly misunderstanding him, not knowing him, not getting why he came, really. Not understanding what he was saying. It was a mystery. I mean, we know that in the, from the Bible about so many things. Are the, this gospel is mysterious, right? It's been, some, of these things, some of these things have been hidden. Some of it is, is prophesied in the Older Testament of things that are yet to come. And like, did they come in Yeshua? Was, was he a part of it? Was he coming to just kind of be the in between between here and here and all these things. And I would and I'm trying to get us to understand that we have got to willingly admit that we've not known Messiah. And thereby we've not known the gospel, the good news that he came to more firmly establish and do a very integral part of course of the whole. Um and, and, and I want to highlight this again in case you missed it or, or forgotten it or whatever the case, because I don't know how long it's been since you saw part two, that I believe that when, when Paul, or rather when Peter was, was approached at the fire by the, by the servant girl, and she said, hey, wait, you're one of the guys that was with that Messiah man. And Peter said, I never knew him. I want to reiterate that I believe that what he said was actually true. Um. And spiritually speaking, as a metaphor, I believe that's so rich for us to think towards is like, is that possible for us that, in fact, we have not perceived, to use that word rightly, we've not perceived or discerned rightly who Messiah really was and who he even is now and what his coming and dying on the cross accomplished for us and what it called us to be today. And so... He, I believe he didn't know Yeshua in the sense that we're talking about. Yeshua is misunderstood. Probably the most misunderstood individual in all, in all the scriptures, perhaps through all of time. And so we're going to move on from that now. Um, and we're going to move into more scriptures that we talked about already a little bit. And so for that case, I'm not going to read them all over again. But I did tell you that Luke chapter 4, man, I spent so much time in Luke chapter 4. Oh my gosh, I, I just was like, I'd read it again and again and again. But let's, let's just stick to five verses, 16 through 21 specifically. He, Yeshua, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. Um, some versions say just an ordinary Sabbath day. He was doing what he had always done. No big deal. Um, in verse 17 of Luke chapter 4, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to Yeshua. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, 
because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, end quote of what he was reading in the prophet Isaiah. And then Yeshua rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. All right, so can we just talk about that for a minute? Just for, I just love to talk about these things. Can you imagine that moment? Yeshua handed the scroll of Isaiah, and he just stands up, starts to read. He knows right where he wants to read. He knows the scroll, and so does everybody else there for the most part. He reads this very specific text, rolls it up, hands it back to the attendant, and sits back down. (laughs) The text continues, The eyes of all that were in the synagogue were fixed on Yeshua. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So, so basically, this launched me down hours of, of thought and, and study and just pinning a whole lot of thoughts towards this. But I, I didn't include them all um, in this study, in this series. But what I started asking myself, well, what was so specific about this day? That day, Yeshua said, the prophecy became fulfilled in their hearing. Why? <laughs> Um, this word in the Greek is uh, for hearing is equal scripturally to the ear. Um, Yeshua used this verbiage a lot as he said, He that has an ear, let him hear. Um, we see this pattern throughout Revel- Revelation as well. Let he who has an ear hear what the Spirit is saying to the called out assemblies. And so this, this is a biblical pattern in hearing. But I was hung up about this day, it, this, this day of unveiling, if you will, of the prophesied Messiah's arrival, the, that the I am, that he was, was fulfilled. It's as if he unloaded a, this giant truth bomb in the synagogue that day, saying, I am the prophecy. <laughs> Me. What Isaiah the prophet spoke of, In this scroll right here, (laughs) I'm right here in the room with you. I asked, well, what was, again, what was so special about this day? Why did he choose that day? Well, simply put, because this is when he chose to reveal his identity. And that's what made it a special marked Shabbat Sabbath day, a set apart day. I love it. I love, I love that just because you know why? Because Yeshua decided that was the day to do it. Which means the father must have told him, son, now what? And what had just happened? His baptism. This is my son with whom I'm well pleased. I personally believe that that if we follow the text in its entirety, post baptism, post 40 days in the wilderness of being tested, he was ready to declare to his father. I'm going to do what you sent me to do, Father. I talked to a, I talked to several brothers about this text. I messaged several and called others, saying, "What do you think about this Luke four text? What's going on? What what is it about this day? Why is it so special? Why did Yeshua choose that day? Well, some things that came out of these conversations, which is why we need to uh, reason with the brethren and 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 discuss these things." dialogue with others, <laughs> is I got so many different vantage points from different men. It was awesome. And one brother said, well, one thing that's just cool about that factually is he didn't read the entire text, Yeshua. Because if you go back and you read that, that portion of Isaiah that he was reading, he stops at the favorable word, and this is very important. He stops at the part of, uh, it ends with, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But the, what, verse pre, uh, what verse follows that in Isaiah, in the prophecy, is then judgment comes. The very, it even says um, right after this word that, that Yeshua ends with, talking about the year of the Lord's favor, in the Isaiah account it says, and, 
and then judgment is brought forth. But Yeshua doesn't read it in its fullness. He closes it up, sits down. And so all the eyes are fixed on him, and they're intrigued because, whoa, he's talking about the year of the Lord's favor. Yeah, awesome. We're in. (laughs) But Yeshua chose to reveal his identity then, and I think... And then I talked to this other brother. He said, you know what? I feel like I feel like he was committed. He was, he was saying at that point, you know what? I'm all in. I'm committed now. And I'm like, I like that. That's true. And that, what is that? It's just another facet of the whole. It's not like, well, this is true, and that's it. And that's all we need to know about it. Friends, the Word of God and the accounts therein are layer upon layer upon layer of things for us to discern and learn from what's buried within these accounts for us. So I love that too, and I thought more about that. That's why I added it to it. I feel like he was saying, Father, I'm going to do what you're you're asking of me to do to fulfill and accomplish your purposes and to do my part to accomplish the full gospel and, and continue the good news. I myself will obey The gospel, as we talked about in part one, I believe Yeshua had to do that by what? Becoming a suffering servant all the way unto death, denying himself. He said, I'm committed, Father, to your plan, to your ways. I believe he said, I myself, I will, what? Endure to the end. Yeshua had just overcome the 40 days of temptation from the adversary. He officially, we could say, begins his ministry, goes to Nazareth on what seems to be this ordinary Sabbath, and then he says these incredible, awesome things. Now, let's keep going on, though, in um, Matthew 13's version of these these same goings-on right here, same time frame, Matthew's um, record of this. Um, Let's read. When Yeshua had finished these parables, he went away from there. And coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, Where in the world did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Aren't his sisters also with us? Where then did this man get all these things? Again, here we are. Didn't get him. Didn't understand him. Perplexed, mysterious, this man, Yeshua. Verse 57 of Matthew 13. It gets real interesting. Why? And they took offense at him. Okay? To use this word, and this is the same word, they were offended. It's scandalizo in the Greek. They were offended. They stumbled upon him. They fell away at what he was saying. But Yeshua said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many works there, no mighty works there. Why? Because of their unbelief. As is the case today, everyone is fine until Yeshua defines who he is and why he came. What will we do if what he really came to accomplish shatters who we thought he was. We're going to get to this hard and heavy here in a little bit. So according to the text, these are people who will believe that they are actually... Oh boy, I got this out of order. Dang it. Okay, I'm going to have to figure this out. Okay. John chapter 16. Okay, I'm fine. I just got a little bit ahead of myself. John chapter 16 tells us this. Yeshua said, quote, I have spoken these things to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will throw you out of the synagogues. Yes, an hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to my Father. Service to God. Okay, I've got to make a note there. John chapter 16, Yeshua says, I'm telling you all this stuff, and we don't have time for all this stuff, but it's to keep you from stumbling. They're going to throw you out of the synagogue, and and whoever kills you is going to think he's actually doing service to God. 
So according to this text, there's going to be people who will believe that they're actually accomplishing God's will by killing Messiah's followers. Now, why am I going to bring this up? Please pay attention. They're not evil, antichrist people that hate Christians. Nobody's talking about that here, okay, in this text. Nobody's talking about that. So are they going to be these evil, you know, worldly men? No, people who think they're pleasing God are going to want to kill followers of Messiah. Now, why would they do this? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 3 of John chapter 16. They will do these things because they have never known the Father or me. Okay, this is this could be huge if, if we had the time. There will be people who truly, wholeheartedly believe they're accomplishing God's will by killing, killing Yeshua's followers. Okay? And why will they do that? Yeshua says... They will do this because they never knew me. And this is gnosko in Greek. This is, this is intimate knowing. Like, for the adults in the room, this is like inter, intercourse related, okay? This is, this is relational verbiage. Like, they never really knew me or my father. Continues on, but I have spoken these things to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember what I told you about them. So, friends, there's going to come a day where people who say they're God's people, God's messengers on his behalf, will want to kill the followers of Messiah to do God a favor. It's very interesting, is it not? Why? Because they've never known the Messiah as he truly is and never known the Father. So we have to look back at chapter 15, which precedes the 16, that these things I have spoken to you. Why? This is so awesome, right? Because Yeshua says, I've told you these things so that you don't stumble. Well, what did he tell them? These things back in chapter 15. Quote, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before you. If you were of this world, the world would love you as its own, but you are not of this world. I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, it hates you. Verse 20, remember the word I spoke to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for the sake of my name, because they do not know the one who sent me. They've not known the Father. If I had come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But they now have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me also hates my father. If I hadn't done works among them that no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and have hated both me and my father. So is fulfilled the word written in the scripture. They hated me for no reason. In other words, I would like to say, just because I'm not who they think I should be. They hate what I'm saying. We're going to unpack what that is that he was saying that they hated later. But when the Helper comes, who I'm going to send you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father, he's going to testify about me, and you also will testify because you've been with me from the beginning. Now notice the theme here. Yeshua was not who others perceived him to be, and those in him will receive the same treatment. Friend, if you're misunderstood, if people look at you kind of funny, if people question your doctrine, beliefs, and what you do and why, that's okay, friend. It's a sign to me, biblically speaking, that maybe we're finding the ancient way. Maybe we're find, finding Yeshua's ways. Why? Because he told us, look, friend, those who didn't understand me will not understand you either. And this goes back to the series we did I don't know, years ago, about being a sojourner. How we're called to not put down roots here in in the kingdom sense of making this our home. We are called to travel through and live according to a governmental order and system that cannot be housed in the governments of men. Why? Because it's my Father's kingdom. It's not of the nations. It is His. And we, like those in Hebrews that went before us that were the honorable, faithful men, were awaiting a better country. 
We're awaiting something else. And in the meantime, if we're really living like Yeshua, we'll be, we will be looked at like he was looked at. We will be hated. And those who say they love God and are trying to accomplish his purposes on his behalf will be the ones who hate us. That's so, that's crazy, right? But they're only doing those things because they've never known the Father nor the Son. And that's harsh, I know, but that's what Yeshua said, not me. This is not my commentary. That's the Word of God in John chapter 16. Let's keep John uh, the Baptist, the immerser, in mind. Yeshua in Luke chapter 7. For John the Baptist has come, eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him. He's a glutton. He's a drunkard. He's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Again, here we are. It's another example of the same thing. The view and vantage point of people outside of the full gospel understanding will not understand the gospel, good news, and Yeshua Messiah himself, myself included, front and center. We have not known him for who he is, and therefore, if we use the word of God, we have hated him. Again, I keep going back to Shaul Paul, encountering Yeshua. Same thing. Why have you been opposing me? You didn't realize it, but in your zeal to do what you think needs done, you're persecuting me, son. Same thing. Different way of saying it in a different account here. Yeshua is saying there will be people who think they're accomplishing God's purposes by killing his very own followers. The Word of God tells us we need to expect that, that that will be what is for us as aliens and foreigners here. So let's get back to offended a little bit more. We continue to talk about stumbling, falling away, and the warnings that we, when we stumble, when we fall away, when we're arrested by what we see and we want to be offended, allow that to take its place, and then move out from there in humility, in repentance, in saying, our first response has got to be, I'm offended at what I see. Yeshua is not who I thought. The gospel is not what I thought it was. When we read the word of God, and maybe even when you hear this, the good news isn't what I thought. Oh no, I'm offended. That's okay. Lay it down. Surrender it. Walk, it, walk away from it and throw a lighter and, and 10 gallons of gas and burn it up. And, and in humility, say, Father, you tell me through your word. What is the gospel? You tell me what is the gospel, really? And then there is hope for us. Let's hear um, the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what has sown, what was sown, rather, along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he does something. What does he do? He falls away. Same thing. I'm using this as an example because Scripture has to be the only thing that gives us proof. The, the Scripture is our proof. He falls away. He stumbles. He is offended, which goes back to, again, what if we have not known the gospel as it really is because we look at the gospel? Ah, oh, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. Even if it's not the real gospel, we're told the gospel is this, and we embrace this, even though it's not the biblical full gospel, and we just fall into it. I'm saying, to be clear and redundant both, the gospel will offend us. It will cause us to stumble because it's not what we thought it was before. And these who do all these things Yeshua just named, they will fall away when the truth comes. It'll fall on rocky ground. Their hearts aren't ready. We're stony. It's the Ezekiel heart exchange reality. If we have not been born again and truly regenerated according to the full good news, it will fall. It will come to us when we read it in the Scripture, when we hear it, hopefully like this in some measure, and it will fall on our stony heart, rocky ground, and it will have no place, and thereby we will fall away and we will stumble. 
And we will miss the beauty of the full gospel. We will be offended and remain there. Okay, for another of the endless examples of what happens when offense comes, let's look at, uh, at, at um, Paul in Acts chapter 22. Now, this looks exactly like the account that we read of Yeshua in the synagogue earlier. Okay, Acts chapter 22. When the blood of Stephen, your witness, was shed, I myself was standing by, and I was approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Again, we, we know this. Paul is recounting what's happened to him. He, he's explaining the word of his testimony. He's just like, look, he's like the people who were healed that Yeshua restored. Like, look, man, I don't know. I'm just telling you what happened when I met this man. This is Paul's version of this. A recount, again, of his testimony. So he says, um, <clears throat> This man told me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Up to this word, they listened to him. Okay, the people listening to Paul are intrigued at his account. Wow, okay. Wow, interesting. Awesome. Okay, please note, this is exactly like Yeshua back in the synagogue. Okay, they were listening intrigued when he's talking about all these prophecies here. And then Yeshua offends them, and they're irate, they're angry. Same thing here. Paul is doing the same thing, recounting what's happened to him specifically. And so they're listening to his testimony, and then they raise their voices after he tells them he's going to the Gentiles. And they say what? Away with such a fellow from the earth. He should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought back into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging. In other words, if I can make this clear, and I believe that, that some of us see this in real life today, they were saying, by action, we will listen, just like G Yeshua back in the, in the synagogue, we will listen to you intently until you tell us what we don't want to hear about the full gospel going out to others who don't deserve it. This is a biblical pattern we could spend hours on, just this one, this piece. We are all in when you're presenting a gospel that is all about what we get and how we benefit from it. We will listen when we are the ones who get favor. Because why? And listen up, Christian America, because we deserve the kingdom. We deserve God's kindness. We deserve God's favor. That's why the, the Pharisees were, were so riled up. This gospel, the full gospel, was being extended to the dog nations, to the people who deserve nothing. They can't know God. It's impossible. We, we are God's people. Look at us. We have his Torah. We have, we have preserved his ways. We are his people. And of course, Yeshua said, yeah, and you've made your own law and exalted it above his. And now you're governed by your own set of law because you've abandoned his. You've added to. Broke a commandment. Gentile church, Goyim nation, Christian church, you've taken away. You've said the law is null and void, no good anymore. It's eradicated. We live how we want. We're in grace of, of Jesus now. You have taken away. Equally guilty. Same problem on different sides of the spectrum. <clears throat> so just like these accounts we're reading, we're cool with the gospel, as long as it looks like what we think it should. But when it becomes something vastly different than what we believe it should be or what we've been taught that it is, it's offensive. We stumble. We fall away, exactly like these accounts show us clearly. What have we been warned in 1 Timothy chapter 6? about anyone that presents to us a different Messiah. We talked about this uh, back in part one that we would get here, and here we are. This is, this is hurtful to mainstream Christianity um, and their understanding of, of Jesus, the, the New Testament, new religion institutor. <laughs> if anyone passes on a different teaching 
and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, and with the instruction in keeping with godliness, he is prideful. He is understanding nothing. Instead, he is obsessed with arguments and disputes about words out of which come envy, strife, slander, evil, suspicions, and constant friction between people corrupted in mind and deprived of the truth. Let's focus in on that last one. Those who ignore these sound words and and this instruction of what Lord Yeshua taught will have all these things because he's prideful and arrogant. He doesn't understand anything. Me, for most of my life. And there will be constant friction between people that are corrupted in mind and deprived of the truth. Now, I would say an examination of this in, in Greek simply explains to be fraudulent. Okay? The, the, they won't, this won't be a genuine body of people because they do not possess the truth. They, they are understanding nothing. They're lacking godliness and in, in instruction and in keeping what godliness even is, is the way this starts in 1 Timothy chapter 6. So to me, as much as this may hurt, it sounds exactly like the condition of mainstream Christianity to me. Friction between people, corrupted in mind, deprived of the truth. Constant friction. And I don't mean good way like iron, iron sharpening iron, friend. I mean like there's constant struggle, battle. Now, all of us can be prone to this. I see this in every movement, if you will, of, of every denomination and, and sect of, of believers on the earth. None of us are exempt. Also, we see this in Second John as well. Quote, for many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Yeshua as Messiah coming in human flesh. This one is a deceiver and the anti-Messiah. Watch yourselves so you do not lose what we have worked for, but instead receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not remain in Messiah's teaching does not have the Father. Anyone who remains in this teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not welcome him into your home or even give him a greeting, for the one greeting him shares in his evil deeds. Now, I'm not saying this teaching now. We're sticking, of course, to the Word of God. But what's he talking about? Talking about What's the teaching? Messiah's teaching. What did Messiah talk about? A kingdom that men did not understand or rightly perceive, and even his disciples looked at and stumbled over and fell away. Friends, again, to be clear, that is our story. That is all of our story. And if we have received a gospel that has cost us nothing, that was easy, that we could just make a decision one night after a church service, walk an aisle and get wet, maybe, friends, we've not known the real gospel. We are not exempt from what all of humanity has shown us in the Bible of how they responded to the full gospel. They were offended. They fell away. The only decision is, will we remain out here offended or will we yield to it, humble our wills, and give ourselves to the Father to say, you tell me what the gospel is. You tell me what is true. This teaching. What is this teaching? Well, we have to go back. Love one another. This is what precedes what we just read. Love one another. It is not as though I'm writing you a new command, okay? This is not a new command. This is so clear. But the one we have heard, or have had rather, from the beginning. Okay, so what is love? Because we're told love one another. This isn't anything new. This is an old command that we've had from the beginning. So what's love then? Verse 6, this is love that we walk according to his commands. This is the commandment, just as you heard from the beginning that you walk in love. Now, why am I reading this? Because of this teaching and and the perpetuity of all that has been presented to humanity throughout all of time that culminates in, in Yeshua Messiah coming and saying, Today, the good news is in the house. <laughs> 
the gospel message, the prophesied Isaiah words is right here, right now. I am in your midst. And what did they do? They missed it. At the table with the disciples, I'm about to be betrayed. You're all going to leave me. No, we're not. They didn't get it. He looks at this person over here. I'll never leave you, Peter said. Never, ever, ever. And he did. He stumbled. He fell away. Friends, I'm telling you, we have got to get to a place where we say the gospel is something that we in Christianity have not known. And even broader than that, humanity has not known the hidden mystery to be found, to be discovered. In the Word of God, this mysterious gospel, we have not known it, friend. And we just need to fess up and admit it. We just need to admit it's true. We're going to move on probably to the conclusion in the next part here. We're talking about this mysterious gospel, the good news. And what's going to happen to us if we disobey it? And what's going to happen to us if we do obey it? And how... Man, others who say they're doing God's will are going to hate us and try to kill us because we're saying this good news that doesn't make sense is true, and I won't waver from that. It's not about me, friend. It's not about you. It's not just merely about me being sinless and going to heaven. It's about a people and and nations coming in to become the Father's possession. Friend, it's beyond us. People will hate that message, just like they hated Yeshua doing it, just like they hated Paul preaching it. They hate knowing that people who they don't think should get in are allowed in through the beautiful blood of Yeshua Messiah. This gospel is all about inclusion for whosoever will obey the gospel. Praise the Father that any one of us are invited in. May we never shut someone else out. None of us are deserving. This beautiful gospel, what in the world is it and have we known it? You're watching the Path to Zion podcast where, to the best of my ability, we're trying to learn the and, and rediscover this ancient way. I thank you for watching. Join into the conversation. Continue to send us emails at Path to Zion podcast at gmail.com. Thank you for watching. We'll come back and wrap this thing up with part four right after this. Amen.